Hi everyone. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking time to join me in part two of a study I've entitled Freedom from Fear. I hope you will have a Bible open there in front of you to Psalm 91. We're focusing on verses 1 and 2, but I want to look at verses 5 and 6 as a way of kind of getting started in our study. Psalm 91 verse 5 says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. How does one endure such things as the psalmist mentioned there that naturally kind of give rise to fearfulness in our hearts? I want, to, I want you to think about something for a minute, and I don't say this to dishearten anyone or to obviously to instill some kind of fear in you, but if you've read your Bible, you know what I'm about to say is true. Everything mankind has built on this planet is destined to fall apart. Sooner or later, all of humanity's efforts to live independently of the Creator of the heavens and the earth will crumble to the ground. All of the monuments of self-reliance that mankind has erected to himself will come crashing down, Political systems eventually will disintegrate. Economic systems will erode. Scientific accomplishments that have boosted mankind's pride higher than the Tower of Babel will come crashing down. Technological advancements that we've come to be so depend on at some point will prove empty and useless when it comes to quelling our fearful hearts. As I mentioned in our last study, the introduction of fear into humanity was a direct result of the fall. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, His explicit orders not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They did. God comes through the garden in the cool of the day and they're hiding themselves. God says, why were you hiding? And they said, because we heard you coming and we were afraid. So fear entered in because of sin. When Jesus comes along, I would also point out that the most often repeated phrase that came off the lips of our Lord was, don't be afraid, fear not, and those kind of things. Don't worry, don't be concerned was constantly telling people, don't be afraid. As our world moves closer and closer to the final day of the Lord, we're going to see an ever-increasing virus of fear. And I call it a virus because a spirit of fear can be very contagious. I want you to look at a passage in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt and they will be afraid. Isaiah is saying that in the day of the Lord, and it's a day that's coming more soon than we realize, one of the major things it's going to cause is uncontrollable fear in the hearts of men. All hands, he says, will go limp. All men's hearts are going to melt. They're all going to be afraid. Jesus reiterated that very same thought in Luke 21, in Luke's Gospel 21 and verse 25, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and here it is, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens 
will be shaken. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, Paul described that time that Jesus spoke of uh, as coming on the world like birth pangs. Things are going to start off somewhat mild, but soon there will be an increasing level of frequency and intensity in the calamities that are coming on the world, and the result of all of that is going to be unbridled fear. So I ask you again, how do you endure such things that should naturally give rise to fearfulness in our hearts? As we watch our world move ever closer towards those things spoken of in Scripture, how can we live without being paralyzed with a spirit of fear? Well, last week, the first point was this. You need to discover a secret place. You want to live a life free from fear? You can't circumvent this. You need to discover a secret place. Simply put, living a life without fear begins by going to our Father first. If you neglect prayer, if you neglect the study, the meditation on God's Word, and you circumvent that, you're circumventing a vital resource for defeating a spirit of fear. Jesus said this about the secret place in Matthew 6, as you'll recall from last week. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Not only do we need to discover that secret place, but we need to enjoy it as the sacred place. He says in verse 1 of Psalm 91, He who dwells abides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Twice he mentions dwelling, abiding. That means that's where you live. It, it speaks of consistency. And it's a reference to the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place. And unlike the high priest who could only go in there one day a year and he got in, he got it done, he got out of there. Here the psalmist is saying, you dwell there, you abide there, this sacred place. And it simply means this, staying close to God our Father is absolutely vital. You can't have a distant relationship from Him and quell fear. And he says that we're to abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and that implies closeness. If you're going to be in the shadow of someone, it implies you're going to be close to them. So many, when faced with fearful circumstances, kind of like Adam and Eve, they choose to run from God. Like Adam and Eve, sewing fig leaves together to make clothing to hide their nakedness, many will try to handle their fears in their own strength and in their own way. Living life independent of God will never quell a spirit of fear that seeks to dominate our hearts and our minds. When we begin to feel fear rising in our hearts, we look at the things that are going on in our immediate world and we wonder, can it get any worse? and we begin to feel fearful, I would suggest instead of running from God that we retreat to our secret place and then learn to rest, number three, in the safest place. Look at verse 2 of Psalm 91. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him. I will trust. Where do you go to find refuge in the midst of life's storms? In the midst of the battle that seeks to conquer our hearts with fear, who is your fortress? Where is your stronghold? Well, folks, if it's in anyone or anything other than the Lord God, your place of refuge, no matter how secure you might think 
it is, will prove to be insufficient. I was reading an article this week about a man named Nikolai Ceausescu in Bucharest, Romania. He had begun building an incredible palace to honor himself. He was quite a despotic and wicked man. And he began this project to build the most elaborate palace on the planet. And while it was under construction, he had at least 20,000 workers working night and day on this. This palace has 1,100 rooms, 14,000 chandeliers, and a carpet in the reception room alone weighed in at 1.5 tons. The opulence of this unfinished monstrosity is about seven billion dollars. Interestingly, about 60 feet beneath this palace, this fortress, was a bomb shelter built in the event that there was ever an insurrection. Nikolai had that bunker prepared deep down underground where 30 families could live for 10 years without ever coming up. Well, there was about six months remaining for the construction to be complete when a revolution, in fact, did break out. Ceausescu, who had that unfinished bunker beneath the ground, had gone into to Budapest to make a speech, as he had often done, and he was standing up there, and somebody yells out, Murderer! And it shook him. Others began to shake their fists at him, and he had never seen that before. And they started to rush the place where he was given the speech, and he started to flee. And he had a helicopter waiting on the roof, and it took him away, and it landed, and he got into an armored vehicle and began to flee. But Nikolai Ceausescu was such a paranoid man, he never allowed his soldiers to put a full tank of gas in the vehicles lest they get away. And it ran out of gas. Now. He has to get out of that armored vehicle and hail a cab, and an ordinary cab driver picks this man up, this great, atheistic, godless, wicked man who's trying to flee in a little cab. He takes him away, and he, before he can even get to his underground bunker, they catch him. They drag him before a tribunal, and on Christmas Day, 1989, they killed him with a firing squad. He had a hiding place. He had a refuge. One like nobody probably had ever built before. But it was absolutely useless. It was a failure as a refuge. We have a refuge, a fortress, that's incomparable with anything mankind could come up with. I want us to consider something about this safe place. Notice in our verses four different names for God are used here. In verse 1, God is called the Most High and He is also referred to as the Almighty. In verse 2, He is called Lord and he is also called God. The psalmist is describing his fortress, and it's almost as if these are the four components of his refuge, his, his fortress, his, his place to go when he's feeling fearful. Folks, we want our lives to be fear-free, not fearful. No matter what the future looks like, so I want us to consider, in our brief time together, four things that are necessary for a fortress. And these four things, as I'm sure you know, are found in the Lord. First of all, just think for a moment about where our fortress is situated. It says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Keep in mind, it is God 
who is your fortress. He is not with you in your fortress. He is your fortress. The word here is El Elyon, and it means the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. That means, folks, He owns everything, and therefore everything is beneath Him. Your fortress is in the highest place. You are seated with Him in heavenly places. And folks, everybody knows that the highest place is the safest place, and we're seated with Him. Go down to verse 14. Psalm 91, verse 14. Look at this. Because He has set His love upon me, therefore I will deliver Him. I will set Him on high because He has known my name. What is His name, folks? El Elyon, the Most High. Where is the, our fortress situated? in the heavenlies, in the highest place. And the highest place is the safest place. But notice secondly, not only is our fortress situated in the high place, our fortress is sufficient. A fortress, in order for it to be worthwhile and secure, it has to be self-contained. You have to have everything that you need on the inside. And the name for Almighty is the word Shaddai. And that means not only the living God, but the giving God. The God in whom is all our resources, all of our necessities, everything we need. Folks, Satan can't starve you out when you abide there. God just keeps on giving and giving and giving. Chesescu had his fortress built. He had his bomb shelter, his place of refuge, and it was stocked to feed 30 families for 10 years. He never made it there, but even if he would have made it there, it was limited. But folks, the Lord, David said, is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Apostle Paul put it this way, and my God, shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So not only, not only is our fortress, fortress situated in the most high, and not only is our fortress sufficient, but thirdly, I would suggest to you that our fortress is stable. In verse 2, he is called the Lord. That word is Yahweh, and it means the great I am, and it speaks of the stability of our fortress. You see, God has no beginning and never has an ending. He is from everlasting to everlasting. You went back one chapter in the book of Psalms, Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God says this, For I am the Lord, I do not change. He can't change. He is forever and ever. Stability. Folks, this planet that we live on is speckled with fortresses that can be dismantled or could be left in ruins. But our God remains forever and ever. To be safe, you need a fortress that is absolutely unchanging. It doesn't disintegrate over the centuries, nor does it weaken from enemy attacks. That's the reason David said in Psalm, or excuse me, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 2 and 3, David said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength and whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. 
Now here's the fourth thing, though, about our fortress. Think not only about the place where it's situated, in the Most High. Think not only about the sufficiency of our fortress. He's the God who's the living God and the giving God. Think not only about the stability. He's Yahweh. He never changes. But fourthly, our fortress is secure. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. God. The word here is Elohim. And it speaks of the security of our fortress. You see, Elohim is used of God when He created the world. It speaks of His unlimited power. Folks, there's absolutely nothing that God cannot do. Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. Folks, He is the one who is our fortress. Do you know what we need to do in the midst of these increasingly uncertain times? I suggest to you we do exactly what the psalmist said here in this psalm. I'm going to find my security in Him. I'm going to find Him to be my sufficiency. I'm going to find my stability in Him. I am going to find my security in Him. Like it says in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When you come to God, when you discover the secret place, and you learn to abide in the sacred place, close to God, you're going to find that you are in the safest place. This doesn't mean that difficult times aren't going to come, of course. It, if that were the case, we wouldn't need a refuge or a fortress. But what it does mean is that no matter what comes down our path through this life, be it a pandemic, be it the pandemonium of a riot, or be it just the common problems we face in life all of the time, we can face those without a spirit of fear because we have an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-loving, always merciful God to bring us all the way to our ultimate destination, which is heaven. He truly is the safest place to be, abiding in Him. Do you know that no matter what befalls you, you have a refuge in the fortress, in the high one, that is the Lord God. I love something that Charles Spurgeon wrote over a century and a half ago, and I'll close with this. Charles Spurgeon said this, It is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. Ill to him is no ill, but it is good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. Death is his gain. No evil in the strict sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. Happy is he who is in such a case. He is secured where others are in peril. He lives where others die. Abide, live, dwell under the shadow of the Almighty and you'll discover that the secret place becomes a sacred place and it is the safest place that you could ever be. I hope these words have encouraged you. May the Lord bless you. Until next time, have a good and a godly week. Take care now.